Well, 2023 has been a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to games. We've had some really good ones so far, and we've also had some really disappointing ones. But it's times like this where I start to feel like there are less games that actually grab me the way that they used to when I started playing video games all those years ago. And I've started to find myself revisiting a lot of older games that I remember fondly in order to remind myself why I enjoy playing them. And so I thought that I would do a thing where I list my favorite games of all time. Uh, yeah, it's actually 20 deep because uh, I got to 10 and still had more that I wanted to put on the list. To be clear, there are a lot of other games that I've spent like hundreds of hours in, really dove into, uh, understand that they're masterpieces, they might even be better games. Uh, there are entire series that have been left off this list that I have played in their entirety. However, these 20 games are the ones that I would take to the desert island. The one that has an electrical outlet, I suppose. These are the ones I never want to forget, uh, the ones I would happily return to to this very day that hold a special place for me personally. These are the 20 titles that remind me why I love video games. So our list starts with Spec Ops The Line, which is the kind of game that fell under the radar a lot when it first came out. But people who played it know it very well. The thing that was really interesting about this game is that it's, you know, is framed in the way of being like a, a cover-based third-person shooter. And it is that. It is indeed that. Uh, and some people might remember it for the sand physics, where, you know, sand would move and change the landscape and even make it so that you could access different parts of the map in different ways, depending on how the sands shifted, which was a really interesting physics mechanic. But the real big thing that Spec Ops The Line did was create a narrative that was essentially Heart of Darkness, uh, watching the madness of war get to your main characters, or maybe it already did. There are like three times in Spec Ops The Line where they have a major plot twist that just reframes the whole thing. And by the end of the game, you really do feel like you have gone through this descent into the hell and madness of war that your characters have. It is shocking how effective it is at that. You cannot forget it once you play it. And it's not a very long game. You might not even really want to go back to it again. But you will never forget it. Okay, so Beyond Good and Evil had an unfortunate release. Ubisoft had it release like right around the same time that they also released Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. That was... Uh, a bad thing mostly for Beyond Good and Evil because it was a new IP and Prince of Persia was an established franchise. So a lot of people would have had to choose between one or the other as like full releases. Now, at the end of the day, Sands of Time was a really good game. But Beyond Good and Evil is just like a masterpiece when it comes to creating an adventure game. Think Zelda, but set on this... Uh, like amazing world of anthropomorphic characters called Hillis, and this wonderful tale that's being woven about this big overarching government entity that seems real nice on the surface or doing the work of the people of this world, and you being the reporter, Jade, that is finding out the mysteries that are behind the scenes. Throughout the time that you are in this game, you also take a lot of photos, not just of the cover-up that's happening behind the scenes, but also of the wildlife 
that is out there and you catalog all of it. The art style, this beautiful cell-shaded art style, Michel Oncel, who actually did the Rayman franchise for a very long time, was uh, instrumental in doing this beautiful style. Uh, it's the reason why it always looks so good in like the HD remasters that they do. But the whole structure of the game and being able to unlock new areas and new abilities as time goes on and traversing in your little pontoon boat uh, and eventually like a spaceship, it's just a lovely and heartfelt and sometimes heartbreaking story that they are able to weave while you enjoy the wonder of exploring this beautiful world that they built. Okay, Escape Velocity is a game most people have not heard of, and one of the reasons is because Ambrosia Software, the developers of Escape Velocity, made it specifically for the old Macs. So, like, old Mac OS systems before 10 ever came along were the only platform that they were able to make this game on, and most of their titles. They were shareware as well, so you basically had to send a way to get a code for the disc that for the game that you downloaded. Ambrosia Software was pretty well known for doing a lot of modern versions of like arcade classics, and they did a really good job at it, but Escape Velocity was probably their most ambitious project. The concept is really straightforward, and yet it works so well. You are in a top-down space game where you start off with this little shuttle. It has very limited cargo capacity, uh, it has like no weapons on it, and it can only jump a couple times to a new system. And you have your star map, and you can see where you go in this ever-expanding universe that you can traverse. You can haul some cargo around, you can trade on a stock market, you can ferry passengers from one system to another, but your options are very limited at the start. As time goes on, you pick up story missions, you work with different factions, and you get money that you can use to buy new ships, which uh, expand a lot of these metrices so that you can go further, carry more, maybe get more weapons so that you can actually dogfight. And this opens up even more possibilities where you might become a pirate and you could uh, disable ships and try and raid them for resources, where you might take on missions to eliminate pirate threats, become like a privateer of sorts. Maybe you actually smuggle contraband from one system over here all the way across the galaxy, get re news reports that there's going to be a shortage of goods over, uh, you know, in Argus or something, and you're, you're five jumps away, are you even going to make it in time uh, to capitalize on that? Tons of options right up until you get into the global conflict between the Rebellion and the Confederacy. And once you get there, you even get access to capital ships and, and that kind of thing. It was a really cool idea. It unfortunately is going to be hard for you to get a hold of these days. It might even be hard to get uh, Override or Nova, which were the sequels, although Nova might be a little bit easier because it did come out on more modern systems. However, uh, there is an open source game that is basically the same called Endless Sky. You can get that on Steam or any other platform. And uh, if you have an interest in this, you should seek that out. It, it's free. Uh, and you can even check out a lot of the mods, which was it was also really great for to see why this was such a cool idea. So this next game just came out a couple years ago, and it wasn't even ranked as my favorite game of the year. I think it was like third on my list, but it really is the game that sticks with me to this day because of how effective and emotional it is, and that's Spirit Fair. Thunder Lotus hasn't done a ton of things that people know about, but this in particular 
really resonates. You play Stella and her cat Daffodil. They are dead. And the first task that you have is to ferry the spirits of the dead from essentially limbo to the afterlife. You have to help them resolve their problems, taking on the role of uh, Sharon, the ferryman, in this. And the characters that you then interact with are these anthropomorphized versions of people that Stella knew when she was alive that have also died. Her friends, people that she cared for when she was a nurse, uh, you know, people that she met along the way, and figure out how to help them so that they can cross over. And the ultimate goal of what essentially is a cozy game where you're building your ferry out and, you know, getting orchards and crafting stations and doing a lot of fun little mini games. You can't die even though you're technically already dead. Uh, the ultimate goal is to help all of these characters uh, come to terms with the things that they had to resolve so that you can help them cross over, and it is devastatingly effective at conveying emotional resonance, more so than I think I have ever seen a game do before. I cannot overstate that. It, it really is very effective. If you ever wanted to have a crash course in emotional storytelling, Spirit Fair is a really good place to start. It also helps that it features this really beautiful hand-drawn art style that really drives home the idea of the personality of the characters, really makes it feel more immersive, more human. Just a beautiful game overall. Can't stress that enough. I have played every Splinter Cell game. Every single one of them. And they were good. But if we were to take the best example of a stealth action game that I could give you, it would be Chaos Theory. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory was the third installment in the series. So you had uh, the first one, and then you had Pandora Tomorrow, and then this one. The reason why Chaos Theory gets the praise that it does today, especially for me, is because they took that formula that they started in the first two games, Ubisoft, I mean, and they really started to refine it. For instance, in the first two games, there was this issue where if you misstepped or did something wrong, basically the game just said you failed the mission. And more often in Chaos Theory, if you made missteps, it just made the game harder. The guards would be on alert. Uh, they would start to get, like, flak gear on. There would be more cameras. They would react faster. They wouldn't do search patterns. They would just immediately react as you start to go through steps and levels. Uh, they also did this really interesting thing where uh, melee attacks or, you know, takedown attacks were a lot easier to pull off and you didn't have to do them directly from the back. You could also do them from the side if you were not being observed. Uh, it felt a lot more fluid. Uh, the environments that you went to also felt much more open-ended in terms of the ways you could work a scenario, work a problem. In the first couple games, it felt very linear, and once Chaos Theory hit, it felt much freer in terms of how you were going to approach each situation. And it was always a joy to be able to, you know, like, pull the guy over the railing on the lighthouse in that first mission uh, and, and just watch him fall down because there was actual environmental activity that you could do. If you like what they've done with the modern Hitman games, it owes a lot to what they did with Chaos Theory. They kept this going through additional installments, but Chaos Theory is really where that series and, I think, stealth action came into its own. 
There's been a lot of talk about the remake that they're doing of Fable, but I wanted to spend a moment to talk about the very original game that Lionhead Studios put together. Because it was very ambitious when it was originally Project Ego. There was going to be a lot going on in Fable. I mean, we were talking about being able to raise kids, uh, watch them grow up, being able to drop a seed in the ground, like an oak seed, and watch it turn into a tree over many, many years, competing against other heroes uh, for territory and fame and everything. It was very, very ambitious. And I will be the first one to say that when Fable actually released, it did not have those things. It was much more pared down from what it originally set out to do. But that did not mean that it was bad in any regard. In fact, Fable was one of the most enchanting fantasy RPGs that we had seen at that time and still stands as a real gold standard. The storyline is pretty standard fare. I mean, you are uh, a kid, and you see your town burn, and you get whisked away to the Heroes Guild to protect you, but also so that you can become a hero and start going out on tasks and find out what happened back then, and who you are, and what happened to your mother and your sister, and everything like that. Uh, the story is pretty traditional fantasy fair, but what they do with the look and the feel and the ambiance of the game and the action-y gameplay that they put forward, as well as the, granted, maybe a little bit broken, but also a lot of fun, good and evil alignment system, is so entertaining, so engaging. Meeting the demon doors and finding out that they need you to complete a challenge so that you can go beyond their uh, their face and you can actually see what treasures they're hiding, only to be greeted with these singular, very creepy, ethereal areas that seem apart from everything else that you've experienced. Going into these different biomes through these uh, dark and, you know, really sinister forests that hide great dangers to eventually some wintry wastelands. It always elicits some wonder about what is next around the corner. Uh, what encounter will I run into? What interesting foes will I face? And they maintain that sense of enchantment and wonder throughout the entire game, which is definitely something that you want from a fantasy RPG, and they deliver that completely. Racing games are very hit or miss for me. I like several of them, but there are many that just don't do anything for me. One of the reasons is the sense of speed. If a racing game doesn't have a good sense of speed, it just falls flat immediately. And one of the best examples I can give you of really feeling the speed of your racing is Burnout 3 Takedown. Uh, there was a few burnouts before this, but when Criterion got around to doing Burnout 3, they really wanted to make you feel like you are racing a mile a minute. Uh, actually, you were racing more like three miles a minute. Not only does it feel like everything is rushing at you, just like a freight train, but you are on the open freeways, and there are cars that are just coming up on you, like from, from zero to 60, phew, phew, right, right in front of your face, and you are swerving around them, and you are, you are ramming into guardrails left and right, and then your car just crashes, and it smashes into a million pieces, and rolls over and over again in this cinematic big blockbuster style crash scene and then you're back on the road and you're flooring it the entire time around corners you're seeing the speed lines like the 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 wind rushing past your vehicle and as you're getting faster and as you're swerving and getting into a flow state the music ramps up and the beats get heavier and you you hear the chunkiness of it as you crash through the finish line at the end, and it is just 
fantastic. The first race you do, you are just immediately in it. But then they go a step further and they have crash mode. And crash mode is one of the best things that a racing game ever did where you can just take different vehicles, crash them into an intersection and see how much damage you can do. But the way that they frame it in takedown is to make it the most cinematic like Michael Bay sort of destruction you could possibly imagine and it feels like you're directing it the entire time the the takedown modes where you're trying to crash vehicles into the guardrails and eliminate them is also just great it turns it from a racing game into like death race it's just awesome there's just fun 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 to be had from beginning to end it, it is octane personified in a video game it is rare that I see that anymore today, although I do like what they did with the Horizon series, and, uh, you know, sometimes Need for Speed gets there too, but the Takedown is the one that sticks with me. This may come as a surprise, but I really like Borderlands. I really like the series. It's a very good series, and I enjoy it. It's sort of like an addiction. But the one that I really, really care about is Borderlands 2. At the end of the day, it kind of has to be Borderlands 2 specifically. One of the reasons was because it took the formula from the first Borderlands and it really expanded upon it. One, because there was a lot more character to it. It introduced a lot of new interesting characters, but then you also actually got to see conversations between them. You got to see the Vault Hunters from the first game as full-fledged characters that you got to interact with that had missions for you. But then it also really expanded the world of Pandora, and by introducing the villain of Handsome Jack, gave you an actual like antagonist to fight. Rather than Commander Steel and whatever Atlas was trying to do, which was just open the vault, they also introduced some new things like uh, slag weapons or E-Tech weapons, and they expand the idea of doing more with the actual guns. One, there are different models of guns, but much more than the first game, unique weaponry acts uniquely. Different kinds of weapons function differently, and far more than just being good at certain things, all the different brands of guns started to get their own personality. This is where, like, TDR weapons ended up being able to be thrown and have them explode for a reload. Stuff like that. That's not something that you saw in the original game, but it is the kind of stuff that they kept expanding upon in subsequent outings. Uh, Borderlands 2 also has some really great moments of character development, it has great DLC, and just becomes the kind of thing that you want to play endlessly. Uh, well, at least until the next Borderlands game came out, but, you know, they were able to maintain Borderlands 2 for like six plus years with content, and people were still gladly playing uh, at the end of that. I got a lot of flack on a recent live show for saying that Bioshock was one of the greatest games of all time, because apparently there are also other great games. Yeah, that's why I said it's one of. Bioshock, for me, is one of the best games that has ever been made. The reason why I say that is because not only did it succeed at being like an immersive sim and giving you lots of different options in how to address situations, but it gave you a really unique storyline about the folly of man, about Andrew Ryan, and about these people that decided to remove themselves from the rest of society who was holding them back in order to create this world of rapture, and seeing that it did not work out nearly as well as they were hoping, seeing the, the collapse of this civilization that you didn't even know about before starting the game, seeing the idealistic people that went there see their ideology fall apart. 
It also introduced some really great mechanics like the plasmids and being able to utilize those in conjunction with weaponry and make some moral choices throughout the entire game, especially when it comes to the little sisters and whether you're going to save them or if you are going to harvest them for Adam. I think everybody knows what the good and bad option are here. Being able to get these different plasmids as well allows you to access different areas. Once I learn how to make fire spring out of my hands, I can, you know, thaw out frozen doors, etc. And the cool thing about it is figuring out how you're going to use the limited resources you have at your disposal to best effect and to the most efficient way possible so that you can uh, deal with the different situations that are going to come up. The big daddies are a huge framework of that because they're very hard to take down and you need to expend a lot of resources to do so. So you have to think about how you can manipulate the area, maybe hack turrets or, you know, turn the splicers, the other enemies in the game, against them uh, in order to uh, minimize how much you have to put into it. At the end, when you actually see the whole picture revealed and see the deceptions that are going on behind the scenes, it just makes you want more from this world. More that we would eventually get with, obviously, Bioshock 2 and an expansion of the idea in Bioshock Infinite. Bioshock is immersive and it is atmospheric and it is the reason I'm so interested in Judas coming out. <laughs> It was going to have to be here somewhere on the list, so I might as well put it here at 11, and it's uh, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Yeah, I mean, it's Skyrim. You could spend your life playing Skyrim, it seems like. There's always something new and fun to enjoy. The mod community has even supported it now, even though it's been over a decade since it originally came out. You'll still see new and interesting mods, not just to update the look and, and the mechanics of the game, but to completely overhaul it. But if we were just talking about the base game itself, yeah, sure, there are bugs, there are glitches, there are exploits to be had galore, granted. But there are few RPGs that are just as ambitious as Skyrim. I can't explain to you the enormity of the game. They do a really smart thing of just keeping it very open-ended after that first section where you escape the noose. Or, I guess, technically, you escape the guillotine. But anyway, after that part where they kind of initialize you into the game, they keep it very open-ended. But there's main stories, and there are subsequent stories, and this is something that they did in other Elder Scrolls games, but this one just took that to a whole new level. Different from Oblivion as well, uh, the world is just as dangerous as it is going to be. There would be this whole thing in uh, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion where if you're a really high-level character and you run across a, a thief or something, the thief is going to have, like, ebony armor on and stuff. That doesn't make a lot of sense for low-level thieves because they keep scaling all of the enemies to you. And in Skyrim, they more or less just said, yeah, everything's just as dangerous as it always is. Like, it doesn't matter if you're a really high-level character. You know, the little goblin dudes are still going to be little goblin dudes. But also, be aware, if you're a low-level character and you try to run up to a giant, the giant is going to fling you halfway across the map. That's just going to happen. Uh, they try to make it very clear that you are not the center of the universe. What happens to you does not directly affect everything else happening in the game. But you still get to forge your own destiny. And you get to play around with these ideas of like what you want to do with your life in this game. If you want to be stealthy, you can be stealthy. If you want to be, you know, combat heavy, you can be combat heavy. You can you can talk your way out of situations. You can steal your way out of situations. You can fight your way out of situations. There's lots of options. If you want to try magic, you can do magic. But simply playing the game and exploring it is also incredibly enjoyable. You'll go behind some bushes uh, and, and find that there's a cavern there. 
And it might not have been a cavern that was part of any mission whatsoever, but lo and behold, there's something interesting in there. I swear that I came across something, I think it was called a dark cavern, that was at the bottom of a waterfall in an area that I had never visited, and this is like hundreds of hours playing multiple characters that I just I never knew about. And I got in there, and there's like trolls all over the place that are trying to kill me instantly. And I, I stumbled upon this when I was a very low-level character. So it it just keeps giving you these new experiences that you didn't even know were there, no matter how long you play, which is the glory of epic RPGs. And Skyrim was a gold standard in that regard. I know I said I had 20, and I do have 20. That was 10, but I'm going to have to save the other 10 for next week. Sorry, folks. It's just, it's it's a really long video, and it's going to be too much to digest. So you're going to get 20 to 11 here, and then we're going to do 10 to 1 on the next one, even though these aren't, really in a great order of operation, but I think that the top 10 are, are definitely priorities for me to talk about. So we'll do that on the next one. Please be safe when you exit the mine. You can take the cart up, but realize that it is, uh, it's from Minecraft, and I made the system, so it doesn't work very well. Is Minecraft going to be on this list? I think everybody knows that answer. 